This morning, I'd like to tell you a bit about our history, our focus, and how we've scaled the content delivery system for Pandora. As you may know, Pandora is part and based on the Music Genome Project. We've been working on the genome for over 15 years, and it's the largest collection of analyzed music and comedy ever created. The genome has millions of tracks, hundreds and thousands of artists, and now over 600 genres. Music analysts are typically have a degree in music theory, composition, or performance. They are trained precisely to do the analysis, and they determine hundreds of attributes per song, including major or minor key, simplicity or complexity of lyrics and rhythm, and the amount of improvisation. This analysis allows us to create hundreds of genre stations, everything from cool jazz to acoustic blues, punk rock, love songs and lullabies, hip hop barbecue, and country barbecue. We combine that with over 50 billion data points, feedback that we've received from our listeners. Our thumbs data helps us create the best list experience, the best playlist experience. As a result, we can take new band music, like for example, my band, The Funkery, and create an artist station that matches our music to the music of our influences, including John Schofield and Galactic. All of this is to play the music that our listeners truly love. And if their pets love it too, that's a bonus. OK, in 2005, Pandora took the Music Genome Project and brought it to the web. When I arrived in 2006, we had grown to over 2 million users. But we still were a very small startup. Like Valve talked about early days, we had many hand-built systems. They were difficult to build. We couldn't rebuild them reliably. System cloning, so we were actually copying over the bad with the good. We had consumer switches, so there was no meaningful manageability. Power management was non-existent, so we would reboot a system and hope it would come back. Sometimes we would have to call smart hands or go to the data center. But it was a different time back then, just to keep you uh, in mind of where we were, we actually moved out of a data center because they couldn't give us one gig of additional bandwidth. There were also some great ideas back then, though. Even in the early days, we knew we should monitor and trend traffic so we could see issues when they arrive. Traffic graphs were all on a console, and we built a really nice custom dashboard so we had all the systems laid out and then we could see them go from green to yellow to red with diminishing health, and of course, bring them back to green. We used just-in-time scaling. Uh, it was not uncommon back then for us to actually meet and order servers on Wednesday to have them received, racked, and configured by the following Thursday peak. Um, Pandora was mostly used at work back then, and so our peak would go up during the work week, and so Thursday was the busiest day before people took a day on Friday. Back then and now, Pandora was a DevOps shop. This was more rare back then, uh, but very importantly, at Pandora, developers respond to issues in production, and that's a big part of the 24-7 response. Much better than throwing code over the wall, it gives them a deep understanding of the production environment, and the essays don't have to guess what the dev's intentions were with code or with design. Uh, increased manageability. So even then, we set about to create a centralized database so we could have definitive build. When we first did this, we took a survey. And at that point, we had 60 media servers in production, and we had 55 different production software configs on them. The original architecture was designed and built around one gig links that we could get from ISPs. There were two servers per link for redundancy in case of a server fail. The servers operated in pairs behind a natted load balancer. The pairs were cleverly named hip hop, punk rock, bebop, and avant-garde. And we were turning up a new gig circuit every month. So when I first got there, we were at about six gigs of traffic, and we were just scaling, scaling to one gig every single month, a new circuit turn up with one network engineer. There was only one audio format, 128K MP3, and all servers had the same content. 
Some of the game changers during this period were mo moving from NAT to DSR, so going to direct server return so we could bypass the load balancer on the way out. We no longer then had to scale the load balancer tier with traffic. Moving from one gig to 10 gig circuits, one of the things that's interesting about that, just in terms of our age, was the first 10 gig circuit that we got was actually passing YouTube traffic earlier in the day. So it got handed to us at 11 o'clock at night to go from there. Um, those changes enabled us to move from server pairs to server pools, so moving from N plus N to N plus 1. And interestingly, at the same time, we moved from load balancer pools to load balancer pairs for greater reliability. We also added a 64K AAC plus file format, so we were now growing new listening at half the delivery rate. In addition to the consumer electronics devices that we supported like Sonos and Logitech, Pandora worked with partners to develop for feature phones. In 2007, we saw the wave of smartphones, the iPhone, Android, Blackberry, and others. Pandora was the number one app on the iPhone, and this was really a huge game changer for us. We saw accelerated listener growth, and CE and auto companies definitely took notice. In consumer electronics, our API and our inclusion in chipsets allowed huge partner growth. To meet the demands of different phones and CE models, audio formats grew from one to two to 14. As a result of the trends started then, approximately 80% of Pandora's total listening hour occur via mobile and connected devices today. So this is the CDN style architecture that emerged. With a number of audio formats growing, we did some analysis and we realized that while we were serving the long tail, there was some very popular content at Pandora. So we realized we could use a three-tier architecture, did some math, and realized that the first incarnation we would use 128 gig of RAM in the tier one. That moved over to Fusion IO over time. And similarly, we've moved from hard disk to SSD. And all along, we've used the Gluster file system, which now supports 60 terabytes of audio, millions of tracks, and 12 different file formats. That also feeds tier one and tier two. Code runs at night and tells the servers which are the popular tracks for the following day, and we use fetch and miss to populate the tiers, to populate the caches. We also run our own content servers for images, videos, and album arts with over two billion requests per day. So we could have used an external CDN, but so far we've chosen not to. We wanted to have our own control for troubleshooting and for understanding every bit about our streaming. We had a good Linux team as well, and so we were keen to keep them, give them something to do. So then we discussed where should we locate the CDN. So first we asked where are Pandora users, and they're everywhere. Our data centers are at the network centers. This, of course, enables us to reach users, as well as to have great options for transit and peering. We actually capacity plan not only for losing a data center, but for losing a coast. Being in California, we're a little sensitive to that. We use DNS Anycast, sorry, we use Anycast for our DNS, yes, and uh, media delivery uses that DNS to go to the network nearest center. So we're able to serve regionally and locally, and this has given us solid national delivery, and we are now the number one in 37 radio markets in the US. On the network side, we build around four basic tenets, scalability, extensibility, fault tolerance, and simplicity. We say simplicity, but it naturally gets very complicated as we go, complex with high number of VLANs, subnets, complex firewalling, et cetera. As our network was growing, we moved from edge and access to edge distro and access switching. We moved to top of rack and put layer three at top of rack, and that got rid of spanning tree, which had caused some issues along the way. Of course, we run our own AS with BGP. That enables traffic engineering, traffic balancing for commits, performance and failover routing. And we now accomplish that through our own SDN, our own software-defined networking. BGP also enables peering. 
So as we were growing, we were working out our peering strategy. We reached out to the community, including Bill Norton, who has a great book on the subject. It covers these scenarios very well. And we felt we needed to determine our locations, our peering policy, and our goals. We decided we wanted to have an open peering policy, be on the major exchanges where we were already going to co-locate. In order to put our strategy in place, we attended NANOG and the peering forums. We joined PeeringDB, which I highly recommend, and we built connections and relationships with the community. Some of the value for peering for us comes from direct connection. This can improve performance. It doesn't always, so you need to monitor for peering. Direct connection also creates a fault separation, so if there are troubles on our front door or regional internet problems, the direct connected uh, connection should still perform. And it builds working relationship with network administrators so that if there are issues and we want to troubleshoot, we actually know who to pick up the phone with or email or chat with. Some things we've learned on peering exchanges. The peering exchange is a large switch fabric and as such strange things can happen. Uh, duplicate IPs, unwanted layer two information can show up. Sometimes the fabric doesn't grow as fast as the participants traffic. So that can be an issue. This can cause issues with transit, of course, as well. You can have transit capacity issues, not just peering. Uh, prefix leaking and odd things can happen. Neither filters nor people are infallible, so we have to make sure to monitor. It's also another edge, so we have to make sure that we're putting full security there. And then we configure our peering to fail towards transit. So we have to make sure that if the peering exchanges are down, we have enough capacity to accept that, those sessions through transit. Let's take a look inside. Along the line way, we learned how to cable. We actually care about that um, because it helps us with airflow. And uh, our folks on our site ops team spend a lot of time looking at power and site and heat in the data center. Also, we don't pull the wrong cable when we're doing system maintenance. We've expanded to five data centers, four domestic, and one in Auckland, New Zealand. There's over 5,000 managed devices, over 2,500 servers, 500 network devices, hundreds of gigabits of, uh, per second of outward facing network capacity. We have multiple public and private peering locations, and we continue to scale the network backbone to carry more peering and management traffic. We use multiple sources of statistics to monitor. We really try to have a monitor everything philosophy, so servers, network devices. I'll call out specifically StatsD is a great one. We've actually instrumented our entire application server, so which is great to see over releases any changes that come up there. System logs and application logs and security taps as well. Um, we basically dump all the data into Graphite and ELK stack. And Graphite is great because we can actually create new graphs on the fly at any time. We also use external monitoring, of course, Gomez, Pingdom, and Keynote to make sure that we're delivering appropriately in the outside world. Twitter is also good monitoring. I'm proud to say that we've become a top 10 deliverer of bits on the internet. In February of 2014, Deepfield listed us as the number nine site on the US internet. And congratulations to Mike at Valve also for making the list. Today, all production media is dual stack, IPv6, IPv4, available through all transit and peering. Our production front door is in progress and is working for certain classes of device. As of December 2014, more than 250 million registered users at Pandora. That's over 100 times when I first started there nine years ago. Pandora has over 79 million active mobile users. In December, you can see it was 81.5. One of the things that we've come to learn for scaling is that people really love holiday music at Pandora. So every year, that's our peak. We really have to be ready before November to see that peak grow. As we ended last year, we were over 20 billion listener hours for 2014. Pandora is the third largest mobile advertising company in the US behind only Facebook and Google. Content is streamed from our content servers as well as external ad networks. 
We have delivery to more than 1,000 connected devices, including smart television, set-top box, internet radio receiver, the ever-popular refrigerator, game console, and wireless home systems. Given that almost half of audio listening is in the car, auto integrations is, have always been a really important thing for us. We've grown these integrations, and over the years, Pandora has 26 major auto brands, including 10 of the top 10 best-selling passenger vehicles in the US. There are also more than 270 aftermarket devices and eight aftermarket manufacturers. More recently, we've been adding Pandora to wearables, including the Pebble and the Apple Watch. And with all that growth, we're just approaching 10% of all radio listening now. So there's a tremendous amount of runway ahead, and as we see the delivery of radio continue in a transition from FM to internet. We're now providing over 1.8 billion listener hours per month. Our ambitions moving forward include bringing music globally to millions of people and providing our advertisers a superior advertising platform and creating a global marketplace that connects fans, artists, and listeners everywhere. Thanks very much. Are there any questions? Yes. I'm, I'm curious if the company has done an analysis of what it costs to deliver content on a, for example, per terabyte basis and how that would compare to outsourcing to a traditional content delivery network. Sure, we have. So I, I don't have the figures to quote, but um, we've actually done that multiple times. Um, so we do look at it, and you can imagine the considerations are everything from data center and server and network costs to staffing costs as well. So uh, it's something that we look at very carefully, yes. Yeah, we feel very good about doing it internally, uh, both about the delivery costs, and there is the one intang intangible about being able to troubleshoot locally, uh, and also a bit of developer cost uh, if we were to move up to a CDN. Anyone else? Okay, thanks very much.